Hi, this is Mac of MaxList. Find Your Dream Job is presented by MaxList, an online community where you can find free resources for your job search, plus online courses and books that help you advance your career. My latest book is called Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. It's a reference guide for your career that covers all aspects of the job search, including expert advice in every chapter. You can get the first chapter for free by visiting maxlist.org anywhere. This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of MaxList. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Ben Forrestang, Becky Thomas, and Jessica Black from the MaxList team. This week, we're talking about how to future-proof your career. None of us expect to do one job alone in the 40 plus years most of us will spend in the workplace. But how do we make sure we don't get left behind by the changing needs of employers? This week's guest expert is Jane Barrett. She says to future proof your career, you need to play to your strengths and you always need to be learning. Jane and I talk later in the show. Each of us chooses the career we want. But our parents' professions can help shape our decision in a profound way. Ben has found research data that shows how our parents' occupations can make a big difference in the jobs we pick. He tells us more in a moment. You have a job that pays less than you want, and it leaves you unfulfilled. But your paycheck covers your expenses, and you have a flexible work schedule that lets you spend more time with your children. Should you look for a new job that pays more? but might offer less family time? That's our question of the week. It comes from listener Leonard Coyer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Becky offers her advice in a moment. As always, let's check in with the MaxList team. And first up is Ben, who is out there every week searching the nooks and crannies of the internet, looking for books, tools, and websites, and other resources you can use in your job search and your career. So Ben, what have you uncovered for our listeners this week? So before I start talking about the resource this week, I want to ask a question to everyone in the studio here, which is when you think back on when you were a kid, what was the first job that you really felt like, I want to do this when I grow up? I wanted to be a veterinarian until I learned that you had to put the animals to sleep, and then I, I didn't oh, want to do that anymore. Gosh. I changed my career path from an early age because of that specific What was your second choice, Jessica? I don't remember. I don't remember. There were multiple like options, but that was the one I remember the first. What yeah. about you, Becky? I, I think I wanted to be a veterinarian for a while, too, but I feel like my very first, like, ideal dream career was I was like probably like five or six and like it was like the summer Olympics and I wanted to be a gymnast we were Ooh. like doing gymnastics Ooh, yeah. on, like out in the yard and I was yes. like oh my dream like I'll have like the leotard and all the glitter mm-hmm. and all that stuff so yeah not quite I didn't quite make it but that's okay uh, so it's I, not too late no it's <laughs> <laughs> yes it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, it was astronaut yeah. because oh, I, I was in grade school in the late '60s and grew up watching moonshots um, when I was, you know, in, in fifth and sixth grade, and I thought that was about as cool as it could get. So those are all interesting choices here, but you guys are totally ruining the theme of my resource this week. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else. So feed, feed us the answers, Ben. <laughs> I will. I will tell you what I, and this is the truth, what I wanted to do. Like the first job that that for some reason I got stuck in my mind I wanted to do was I wanted to be a stockbroker. And I remember in like- Wow, that's my father's profession. (laughs) There you go. Uh, (laughs) Like when I was in in fourth grade, like we had to like draw a picture of our future selves and I drew myself in a three-piece suit with like a briefcase and a hat and 
I, I guess I thought stockbrokers wore hats back then, but um, they might have. So the reason I I asked about the jobs you wanted as a kid was because I unearthed this really interesting article about the jobs that we choose as adults and how our parents influence those jobs. Okay, so Ben, I got to ask, knowing that your parents met in a commune, uh, was your, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to hear about the connection between stockbrokers and your your parents' occupations. Uh, I must have been the Alex P. Keaton of the family. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, uh, you know, this comes from the New York Times, and it's an article called The Jobs You're Most Likely to Inherit from Your Mother and Father. And the idea behind this article is, for better or worse, parents have a huge impact on their children, and we know this is the case for you know, everything, our political beliefs, our religious beliefs, but it also comes into play when we talk about the careers we choose as adults. The New York Times looked at generational employment data uh, from 1996 to 2016 and found some really interesting trends about the stickiness of your parents' career as it influences yours. So things like working sons uh, of working fathers on average are 2.7 times as likely as the rest of the population to have the same job and two times as likely to have the same job as their mothers. So basically, like if your father was a stockbroker, it's 2.7 times more likely that you'll be a stockbroker compared to anyone else who uh, is making a choice to enter stockbroking. The same effect is uh, true for daughters, although it's a little less strong. It's uh, daughters are 1.8 times likely to have the same job as their mother and about 1.7 times as likely to have the same jobs as their father. Mm -hmm. And the influence of your parents, uh, it really depends a lot on what exactly they did for a living. So some careers seems to have a lot more stickiness with success successive generations. Like I think the jobs uh, that are, are most sticky are things like uh, legislator, banker, lawyer, entertainer, doctor, also steel worker was listed there is, is one of the ones. Um, and in this article, a lot of interesting information, especially if you're a data person like me, but uh, it also has a little widget there where you can enter your career and see how common it is for successive generations in a family to have that career. So you could go and type, you know, veterinarian, and it'll tell you like, oh, it's really common for children of veterinarians to go into veterinary medicine. Quick question, Jessica. Were either of your parents veterinarians? No. Becky, either of your parents gymnasts? Unfortunately not. No astronauts in the Pritchard family. <laughs> okay, just checking. So, you know, I think one of the things that you can take away from this article is that some of the careers that are the most sticky, you know, things like legislators or entertainers, there's like a strong lifestyle element to that, right. you know, where, um, you know, a legislator, especially at the national level, is kind of living their career all the time. And so that passes down. And the power of name recognition is huge there, too. So you're passing your name on to your children and they're kind of right. riding in your coattails. Um, and they actually talk about this a little bit. They say one of the big factors in passing down occupations um, and the advantage and disadvantage of that is the connections parents offer their children. So children who pursue the same job as their parents often start well ahead of the competition when it comes to like having the, the wherewithal, the connections, the kind of background knowledge it takes in that career. And children often pursue their parents' jobs because of what they call the breakfast table effect. You know, family conversations when dad or mom come home from the day and start talking about their jobs and the stresses or the right. great things that happen, like the kids internalize that and it fuels their interest to learn more about it or kind of, again, gives them that leg up in the, in the process. Yeah. So this is great data, but how does this help job seekers, Ben, for our listeners? What difference can this make in a search or in managing their career? Well, I guess the most important one is that if you want your child to be an astronaut, you better go apply for NASA right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so I think there's a couple takeaways from this that are important for job seekers. One is that this just provides kind of a framework to think about career choices that we've already made. You know, we tend to think that we have a clean slate when we make career choices, but so much, so many of the choices that we make are kind of defined by things that happened in our past, specifically our parents. And so I know a lot of people who are like, I have to be a lawyer because my father was a lawyer, my grandfather was a lawyer, and they don't realize that they're kind of being kind of pushed into that, whether they want to be a lawyer or not. Right. So um, I guess one lesson would be like, know that there's a strong effect there and be conscious of it so that you have the, the space to break away from that if you don't want it. The other thing here, and this is not going to be a surprise for anyone who listens to our show, is uh, I think this data really underlies the importance of networking. And one of the strong reasons why 
you know, the child of a polit politician enters politics themselves is like they already have that network built in. Like the donor class, the friends, the other influencers are all like family friends. And so it makes it very easy for them to enter into the career. Same thing if you're talking about veterinary medicine. You know, other vets are already kind of built into your network as family, friends, and acquaintances. And so it makes it much easier for you to slide into that career. And so like we talk so much about networking in the show, the importance of networking, building up your networks. I think that's, you know, that's where all this generational stickiness comes from. Um, people have networks, so it makes it easy for them to enter into that, that field. We can't all be the, the children of astronauts or politicians or entertainers, but we can take those lessons, that idea that you know, if you build a strong network, it makes it easier to enter some careers um, and apply that in our own job search practices. Good. Well, interesting stuff and food for thought. I, As you talked, the other thought that went through my head, Ben, was the powerful example that are set set by people in our families, whether it's our parents, uh, but also aunts and uncles and grandparents uh, who may be in occupations that, uh, and that by example show us that we could do those things as well. Uh, and I think if, if we all reflect on our family tree, uh, particularly going back a generation or two, there are likely examples of jobs where we might not be doing exactly that occupation, but there are parts and pieces of it that we are doing. And I think those examples uh, probably make us comfortable taking on challenges that might seem unfamiliar at first. Exactly. It's um, you know, We always talk about like going out and talking to people who do this. You may well already know someone who does what your, quote, dream job is. You know, It might be your uncle or your uncle's daughter. I guess that's your cousin. Uh, but, you know, getting, getting to know what the folks in your family do and talking to them about their careers can be a really powerful tool in, in figuring out what you want to do yourself and then figuring out how you're going to get it as well. So, again, this article is called The Jobs You're Most Likely to Inherit from Your Mother and Father. It's from the New York Times. And as always, we'll include a link in the show notes. Okay, great stuff. Well, thank you, Ben. If you've got an idea for Ben, he would love to hear from you. His address is ben at maxlist.org. And we'd love to share your idea on the show. Now let's turn to you, our listeners, and Becky joins us to answer one of your questions. So, Becky, what's in the Maxless mailbag this week? This week we've got a question that came in via email from Leonard Coyer. He's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and he writes, um, I am in a job that underpays me and does not utilize my skills in a way that leaves me feeling fulfilled or productive. However, I have two young children, my earnings are sufficient, and the lifestyle and flexibility is better than I can imagine. So do I search for something else, knowing that I am likely to work harder and have less time and flexibility for my family? Or do I stick it out while my children are young? If I stick it out, what do you recommend I do to make sure my skills don't get rusty and I can credibly say that I have them in the future? And also, for a little more context, business is my general area of expertise, but I've always been more interested in making money by helping others than in simply making money. That's why customer service roles have worked for me and why sales and marketing only works if I can convince myself that there is a group of people that need the product or service that I offer. The work I currently do leverages none of my skills or interests. So... I feel like the last line of Leonard's email really hit me hard. Yeah, me too. Um, the fact that he says that none of the skills and interests or interests that he has are being utilized in the job that he has. And while there's no perfect job for anybody, there's always going to be a downside to some job. I think that it doesn't sound like Leonard is in the right place in his current role. Um, and he mentions a few things about like flexibility and sort of work-life balance. Um, I think that like the the ability to be flexible in your schedule and having enough time outside of work um, is very important, especially when you have young kids to care for. But the other thing to keep in mind is that the job that you have isn't the only one that offers flexibility. So, and it sounds like he's you know you're not feeling great about your current role and. While you know that flexibility is important, it shouldn't be the thing that keeps you in a job that you're miserable in. Mm -hmm. um, I think that something that would help at this point in your thinking about your career search, Leonard, is to do some research, um, get some perspective about what else might be out there for you. You obviously want your work to mean something to you. You want to be a positive influence in people's lives. Um, 
when you think about your values, are there organizations that you see lining up with those values? And um, go research those organizations, you know, check out their careers pages, see what kinds of benefits that they have for their employees, because a lot of great organizations also have great work-life balance, great flexibility in their cultures. So I think that will give you some inspiration for what types of avenues you might take for your job search if you do decide to leave. Um, so that would be something that I would recommend you do right now. Um, and then another thing that I really like and I recommend people do a lot is to do this exercise that might seem a little silly, but I think it's good. Um, write down all the details of your ideal work day, mm -hmm. like all the details that you can like fit into it, like what time you wake up in the morning, like what you, you know, where you have breakfast, if you're spending time with your children in the morning, or if you're going to work early, what you're doing in your work day, like details, are you in a lot of meetings? Or are you working alone? What are you working on? What type of environment are you in? Are you working from home? Are you in a big office? Are you working in teams? Write all of those details down and you'll have a much clearer idea of what you want so that you can sort of use it to measure against the job opportunities that you're researching and seeing like, is this really matching up with what I want to do? Um, so I think that those th two things will help you, you know, just get some context about your situation and give you some inspiration for what you might be able to do to retain that flexibility, um, you know, the benefits that you have in your current job while, ha while finding some of that value um, in your day-to-day -day operations at work. So do you guys have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, that last line about the no, the skills and interests are not being there yeah. really hit a, a concrete, you know, nerve or whatever. Um, in that I think that there's a lot of suggestions that can be given and I, I'm going to give a couple of those in a second, but I also feel like that right there pinpoints that he's very unhappy in his job and it's not just a, um, a fix the current job. It's sort of a, if, I mean, you don't want to be miserable every day, even if it right. gives you all the flexibility that you want. And I think mm -hmm. flexibility in your job is really important and that can often be um, one of the trade-offs of you don't make as much money in your salary, but you have a great flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's a really important component to Leonard is having that flexibility and being home for his family. But also, you know, you're not going to be, if you're have more flexibility, but you're miserable in your job, that's also not going to be good in the long term. Yeah. It's going to bleed into your personal life too. Absolutely. And so I like what you were saying about that. You don't have to be stuck in this job, that this is not the only job that gives you flexibility because I think that's a really important mindset shift to have is yeah. that um, you don't have to settle for something that you dislike or that makes you really unhappy just because you think that that's the only thing that is going to be out there. So mm -hmm. I would also suggest just casually looking around to see what else is out there and the, in the industry that you want or I like that idea of writing down kind of where your priorities are and what you're looking for so that you have that clear sense and have a lot of focus. I would also say if you don't want to, if, I mean, I, I think that that could be a very low risk situation where you're just looking. It doesn't mean you have to actually leave. You're just mm -hmm. seeing what's out there, seeing if there's a match. Um, but if that also feels too stressful or too risky and you don't want to do that and you want to stay in your current job, um, talk to your supervisor or your manager or your boss or whoever it is mm -hmm. about how to incorporate what you want to do into your current role. And, um, you know, just express that, you know, you want to stay in this organization, but number one, you feel that you should be paid more and get some concrete data, get some, look at the market rate of what you should be paid or what you, you know, what other people in the same title is, are being paid um, and bring that to your boss and also talk about how to incorporate new things that are going to um, leverage your skills and your interests into something that is, is, can be potentially something that you enjoy and that will grow into a future job opportunity. So those are my couple thoughts. So I think this gets to the question of what is meaningful work 
right? We always talk about meaningful work, but don't really define what meaningful means. And that's because it's really subjective. Like what creates meaning in my life might be very different from what creates meaning in yours or Max or Jessica's. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say for some people, um, meaningful work might just be the you know the ability to take care of my family, to make enough money. Uh, to provide for them, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, you need to decide for yourself. You kind of what are the what would make work meaningful? And mm-hmm. there could be multiple levels of meaning there: monetary, uh, responsibility, social impact, things like that. And so, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, I, I really think that Leonard needs to kind of reflect on his own needs and uh, what would be important to him, mm-hmm. um, and know that like there's. There's probably no absolutely perfect job where you get everything you want and all the flexibility you want, but there's probably a lot of opportunities there where there's overlapping in meeting and all the different definitions for it and gets you a lot closer to what you're looking for than what you're at now. Yeah. And I liked your advice, Becky, about envisioning uh, other possibilities because I was struck by his question saying uh, in, in the first part that it was... What he has now, he can't imagine anything better. And I, I think mm-hmm. uh, your advice is spot on because I think we we should all step back and 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 try to envision something better and 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 describe it and put it down on paper and mm-hmm. and then to Jessica's point, see what it would take to to make that vision happen uh, and and look at the practical steps that would be involved. So. Uh, great question, Leonard. Uh, great, yeah. great advice, Becky. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody on the team. And Leonard, let us know how it goes. Uh, and we'd love to hear what you uh, decide to do next. So if you've got a question for Becky, we'd love to hear from you, too. Just send her an email. Her address is becky at maxlist.org. Or call the listener line. That's area code 716 Job Talk, Or post a message on our Facebook page. Uh, However you reach out to us, if we use your question on the show, we'll send you a copy of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. And we'll be back in a moment. When we return, I'll talk with this week's guest expert, Jane Barrett, about how to future-proof your career. We've been making Find Your Dream Job for more than two years now, and it's about time we got to know you, our listeners, even better. I really want to know, what do you like about our show? What do you think we should change? And what's the one topic that you wish we'd cover? Our first ever listener survey is live now through February 28th, 2018. And you can take it at maxlist.org slash podcast survey. It'll take you less than five minutes to complete, and you'll be entered to win one of three $50 Amazon gift cards. So take a few minutes right now to complete our survey. Go to maxlist.org slash podcast survey We'll also include that URL in the show notes. And thank you. Now let's turn to this week's guest expert, Jane Barrett. Jane Barrett is a guest lecturer at leading business schools in Europe and an executive recruiter. Her clients include banks, blue chip companies, and startups. She's also the co-author of How to Take Charge of Your Career and the host of the podcast, Grow Your Own Career. Jane joins us today from Harrogate in the United Kingdom. Jane, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And our topic is one that will interest, I think, anyone, no matter where they, what point they might be in their career, and that's how to future-proof your career. Jane, I know you've written a lot about this. Can you tell us what you mean by that when you're talking about how to future-proof your career? I think what I mean by that is to have a have an idea or have some idea of where you might want to go in the future. I mean, no one knows for sure what's going to happen, but I think it's very easy just to carry on doing what you've always done. And sometimes then what happens is you your skills become obsolete. So I think it's what I try and do with clients and in the work that I do is to help people think about the future. Where is that moving? And help them to think about what can they do to skill themselves, so upskill, um, to learn more things that might help them in their future career, make more connections so that they can call on their connections if they're looking for a job, for example. 
And just be aware that things are changing and, and they need to stay current. I think particularly um, as you get very established in your career, maybe later on, you can sometimes what we call in the UK, I suppose, just sit there and kind of relax and sit there being uh, a little bit complacent about your career um, and not really kind of be thinking about the future. So that's what I mean by future-proofing your career, just starting to think about where is it going, where do I need to, to upskill, continually looking to develop yourself, really. And w what what would you say to people who, who might think, well, you know, I'm, I'm just happy right where I am and this is okay. Uh, I don't need to always be moving up or, or, or changing. Uh, is there a risk in, in taking a position like that, Jane? I think there is because if you don't, if you don't manage your career, it's very unlikely someone's going to step in and do that for you. And while that might be okay now, um, in two, three, four, five years time, where are you going to, to be? Are you going to be, if you, if you then get made redundant or you decide that you don't want to stay in that role, have your skills kind of, um, have they lost value in the market? Um, it's, it's funny. I was doing some interviewing today actually. And, you know, I, I think there are, there are some new skills that people can learn. This is in, in kind of the admin technical side where they can really differentiate yourself, um, from other people by know, knowing what's going on, knowing what are the new tools out there, knowing, um, what you could use and, and actually perhaps getting some experience of that, not necessarily in work because it's not always easy to do that if you're in an organization that doesn't like a lot of change and new things, but perhaps you might be able to use, develop your skill self and use those skills in a volunteer capacity. Well, I, I do want to talk about how to do this kind of future proofing, but one last question about the need for it. I'm, I'm thinking of people who might be later in their career, uh, perhaps in their late 50s, early 60s, and mm -hmm. they might think, oh gosh, the end is within sight. I just have to hang <laughs> on for two, three, four years. Uh, I don't really need to worry about this anymore. I just need to get to whatever retirement age goal I've set for myself. What would you say to people like that, Jane? Um, it depends how far off you are, I suppose. But I suppose what I see, and it was in the F Financial Times today, actually, that quite a lot of people retire and then realize that actually this is quite boring being retired <laughs> and I actually want to go back to work. Um, and certainly what I'm seeing is people wanting to work longer. It's expensive to, to retire and, and actually people want to work for longer and some people have to work for longer um, because of general expense of living. Perhaps that's just in the UK, but I um, I would say be careful with that by, by making assumptions that you might not want to carry on doing work. Um, so, you know, it is worth thinking about, well, maybe it would be interesting to learn new skills as well, you know, good for the old uh, brain cells to, to learn new things as well. Um, you know, I can think of the most vibrant people I know at that kind of age are often people who are still learning new skills um, and kind of developing themselves. So I think it's a bit of a dangerous assumption to think, well, you know, it's only a few years now. I'm just going to sit back. Um, you may not like being completely retired and you might want to still contribute and be, you know, in the working um, environment. So, you know, maybe that's a dangerous assumption to make. Well, let's talk about how to get started on this. Uh, once you've made the commitment to, to do this kind of future proofing, what's the first step, Jane? Um, it's, it's worth taking an audit of, of where you are right now. So thinking about, okay, what are my strengths? What are my values? What's important to me? And this will change throughout your career. Um, what are you really interested in? What, what are the trends in your, uh, that you're interested in and, and might affect your sector as well? So let's say, you know, technology obviously is a big one. And how is that actually impacting the area that you're working in and giving that some thought? what kind of environment you like working with, what kind of colleagues, and, and what are your longer-term plans? Um, kind of 5, 10, 15 years' time, and work out if you've maybe got commitments such as children or perhaps ageing parents, that might change how you, um, your, your, your longer-term plans and maybe where you want to live, what you want to be doing. And then bringing that all together, start to think about different options for yourself. I think it's very useful to kind of do this kind of, 
stop and thinking about things and then looking at different options. And then when you're looking at different options, evaluating them against what you're saying is important to you at this point. And that's the point when you can have informational interviews so you can meet people, talk about uh, what they're doing and whether that would be a good fit for you moving forward. Um, and and that, that's when you might identify a gap and think, actually, in five years' time, I don't want to be doing this anymore. I'd like to be doing something else. And actually, that is a really good fit for me. So I'm going to look into perhaps getting trained up in that area or getting some experience. So you might think about doing some uh, volunteering, some experience to, to move into that sector. And you've outlined a, a really sensible approach to career planning. And for some people, because of daily responsibilities, family, uh, the, the job itself, it can seem intimidating to take on a uh, that kind of career planning. What's mm. your best advice, Jane, for, for how to do that? It, do you recommend people look at books, uh, work with university alumni offices or career services offices, a coach perhaps? What have you seen? Yeah, more? I mean, you, you, you can certainly, um, there's, there's lots of career books around. Um, and obviously I've written one as well that, that look at those kind of areas, that kind of career assessment. I mean, I've, I've put together a, a summary sheet. So that the key areas you should be thinking about, and you may know the answers to those questions, but maybe you haven't done looked at that in a, in a structured way. Um, I think it's, it does seem a bit overwhelming and, um, but if, but I think you know, I think I, I would say this, but I think careers are incredibly important, and they they can um, you know, they have the potential to make you very happy or pretty miserable. So it's an important part of your life. So it's important that you think about it. And and I know that some people don't give it a huge amount of thought. I mean, they maybe plan for their holiday more than they plan for their career. Um, I'd like to train change that, and I think a lot of career coaches would like to change that because we sometimes see the downside of that where people haven't planned and they've just let things drift and then they find themselves in a position where their skills are, are not needed in the marketplace and they've kind of um, kind of well they've not they've not kept abreast with technology and therefore it's quite hard to make that 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 upskill um, so so yes I, I think there are there's a, some thinking you can do books career coaches um, but I I would recommend you do at least some kind of thinking to start to think about um, those different options and things like alumni uh, department. If you went to university and they've got alumni department, they can help identify people who are doing the types of things you might want to do. But but also your friends and family, once you, you're clear on the kind of things that might be a good fit for you, they might be able to help you identify people. And, and obviously LinkedIn is a fantastic uh, tool for doing that as well. So once you're clear about those goals and, and what you might want to do in five, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years, and you identify a skills gap, how do you go about plugging that skills gap? I think that one of the key things is to talk to people doing the kind of thing you want to do um, and ask them, you know, do you, do you need to get qualified for this or do you need to get experience for this? Or if you were going to get qualified, where would be the places you'd recommend? And talk to them about their own career journey. Um, I mean, sometimes it's not necessarily to, necessary to do a lot of retraining you just need to get some experience and experience can go a long way and build your network and you know so i think for certain careers it's all about who you know and being part of that that industry or that um that um you know a lot of work gets referred and, and i think also it's quite hard to know what's the best training but the people in it who are doing it will often be able to help you um, I think it's quite interesting. I was speaking to somebody who wants to be a florist and she, uh, she needs to get some experience. And she said she's really struggling in her hometown to get some experience because obviously they're going to think she's going to set up a competition. Um, so you might have to do get some experience in a different different uh, town. <laughs> uh, she has family in, in London and so she's probably going to do a couple of uh, weeks uh, work experience. She's a, a mid-career changer. Um, just because it's quite difficult to do it in her hometown. Yeah, I, I love your suggestion about talking to people and getting their advice, the people who have these skills or have had these experiences and, and finding out what the best way to do that is because I think often, and I, I'm curious to hear your take on this too, Jane, um, people think that you have to make expensive or time-consuming investments in uh, degree programs or mm. extensive retraining and 
And sometimes when you talk to people in that field, you, you get a very different picture, don't you? Mm, yeah, absolutely. And things can change, you know, quite quickly. You know, I think uh, education doesn't always catch up in the same way of, you know, doesn't move at the same speed as, as maybe people in that field. And they might be able to say, well, actually, you know, that's that's pretty obsolete now. That it's going in a different way. I would suggest you do you do this. It's much more tailored to what the market needs. So I think only by talking to people do you find out that kind of information um, and whether it's really worth doing that qualification in, um, would you be better getting some experience or doing a shorter course or, or whatever. So definitely talking to people in, in the field. And I think that's where people fall down. It's where I've fallen down in the past, for sure, by not talking to people doing what you think you want to do. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, so talk to people in the field that, and if you're considering making a transition, perhaps switching careers as part of future proofing your career, uh, how much time do you find in, in your work with people that you need to allow for those kinds of changes? It can take some time. I mean, it can definitely take uh, a couple of years to make that happen. It, it rather depends whether you have a big war chest of money. <laughs> I think that, that does help. Um, but most people I work with, and when I changed career, I didn't have that either. And I had to make a slow transition into what um, I'm now doing. Um, you know, you sometimes have to take some part-time work or contract work to kind of give yourself a bit more flexibility so you can do some studying or have time to 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 get some different experience. Um, and it also depends whether you've got a partner that can support you while you, you make that career change. There are lots of different ways that you can make that happen. I mean, I've known people sell their house and downsize to something smaller or move to a more affordable area to release some equity so that they can buy a bit of time. In, in retraining and getting established in a new field. So this is why it's so important to do this career thinking before making, you know, big changes in your life. Um, you know, uh, do, do your homework, do your due diligence, work on yourself, think about what it is you really want. So as much as possible, you have kind of done your homework to make sure that this is going to be the right move. So not only working on yourself and trying to understand what you want and what you have to offer, but also what's happening in the market. And is this a realistic idea um, about the direction you want to go into? And it, it can be frustrating at times, you know, you think, oh, I'm never going to do it. It's taking so long, but it will pay off. That kind of research will pay off. And when you do that kind of research, uh, do you find that it often doesn't mean dramatic changes or switches in careers it can it can also mean small mid-course corrections as well can it yeah sometimes it can and that's why this thinking at the beginning is really important because you know you may find that actually it's just the environment that's wrong so you don't need to make a radical change but you actually need to change company the company's not right for example or you just need to change industry but not actually function um <clears throat> so you know, it's really worth doing this in-depth thinking. I think some people get, and I've, I've been in this position myself, where you get so unhappy in a job that you just say, oh, I'm just going to just chuck it in and resign and I'm just going to do something completely different. Whereas actually there will be some of those parts of that job, hopefully that you did enjoy, um, and you can kind of analyse what exactly was wrong with this. So taking that time can mean that you make a more thoughtful decision about what you're going to do next. And absolutely, sometimes it's it's tweaking that and it's not making a radical change. Yeah. So whether it's a modest or, or a big change, uh, it, what I'm hearing is change is a constant and we need to be ready for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. I definitely do. I think, you know, things are changing in this world. You know, technology is changing things. Uh, the job market's changing. And, you know, certainly in the UK, we've seen the consequences of, of not being agile and not keeping an eye on the future. And it's something that uh, a lot of career coaches here, myself including, are keen to help people with and try and raise that awareness as, of, of <coughs> thinking about your career in a more proactive way. Great. Well, uh, excellent advice. Now, Jane, tell us what's next for you. So, um, well, we're, I'm, I'm carrying on with my podcast. Um, and carrying on with the work that I do um, with 
my European business schools. We have a, an online program that we're developing. Um, so that that's continuing. Um, and also next year, I'm planning to do a social enterprise. So trying to work more with children. Um, so historically, I've worked uh, with adults, um, particularly MBAs and alumni. Um, and I want to work with, with the younger age group. So that's going to be happening next year. Great. Well, I know people can learn more about you and, and your podcast and, and your book by visiting thecareerfarm.com. And I know you have a special offer for our listeners at thecareerfarm.com slash summary. Yeah, so it's just basically a summary of what we've talked about today. So some of the things to think about, it's a download sheet that you're able to kind of work through yourself and think about those things I was talking about. So what are your strengths and values and interests and longer term plans to kind of help you plan your career a bit better. I will be sure to include URLs to both of those pages Thank in you the very show much. notes. All right, Jane, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. I hope that was useful. It was. Thank you. We're back in the Maxless studio. Uh, what are your reactions to my conversation with Jane about future proofing your career? So whenever we talk about this idea of like being proactive in your career, even if you have a job, you know, keep your options open, keep looking, keep refining your skills. Part of me always like, oh, that's a lot of work. Who has time for that? But it also hit me when she was talking about like you. A lot of people get to a point at a job where they're like, I hate this. I'm gonna just throw it all to the scrap heap and start again. And like that's a really painful experience to have doing that. And so like a little bit of an ounce of prevention on the front end is where the pound of cure on the back. And if you can take little steps to keep yourself, your skills relevant and keep connected with your network and, uh, you know, taking steps that, so that you're always employable throughout your career, even if you have a job you love, that's really going to pay dividends in the long run. Because and frankly, you never know, like you could have a dream job and then the company disappears overnight. That happens. That happens. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. it's it's totally worth um, that little bit of extra effort. Uh, yeah. And I think of kind of piggybacking on what you were saying is um, I think it's really good to be able to, you know, your job title or your job, your current job, as much as you love it right now, you don't want to be doing that in five years either. So continuing to, f to figure out ways that you can continue improving upon your job and make it um, make your interests stay really high as well and make sure that your skills um, are matching and that you're just continuing to be the best possible. I think that's really smart. And then I liked what she said about um, looking at the market and the tr like future trends as well because that's part of it too. It's not just, um, you know, your job could go away at any second, but it's also looking at, at what skills are going, going to be relevant in a couple of years when, you know, pot potentially robots take over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not laughing about the possibility of automation, but I, I would say, uh, to your point, Ben, I think it, often when people are in jobs that they've come dis to dislike, remember there was a time when they took that job and they accepted the offer they were very excited about right. it. So something changed, uh, maybe the mission of the organization or you just outgrew the responsibilities, but uh, things didn't stay the same and they never do. They and, never do. And, and Jane's point is you got to think about the future and how to prepare for it because change is the constant. Uh, the only other thing I would add, I think you guys all made good points, and it can be really tricky to stay on top of your career and like do the work to sort of think about future proofing when you're just trying to like get through life and like do your job every day. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. And I think that one one piece of advice I would give is like give yourself like a couple hours a month that's like dedicated to doing, you know, doing some reading on trends in your industry and doing some reflection about where you're at in your career and what skills you want to develop and just sort of keep like a little journal and like keep, you know, some some records so that you have some sort of structured evidence of like your process and so that that gives you a little bit more concrete sort of like I'm working on my career and you feel good about it and like you you can start to jot down, you know, tools or ideas that you have and I think 
just putting some structure around it and not just being like, yeah, do some thinking, do some, you know, it's all very broad and it can feel like a lot. But when you really just like dedicate like a chunk of time and and then like just go about your business the rest of the time, yeah. you can sort of let that worry slide off. <laughs> no, that's a really good point because I yeah. think that um, sometimes a lot of the, the what Ben mentioned that Jane mentioned of people sometimes ha- wanting to do that 180 shift Mm -hmm. is comes from not checking with themselves on a regular basis and getting too far down the line where they haven't been, you know, keeping up with what, what it is they really want and what their goals are. And then pretty soon it's, you know, 10 years down the line and they Mm -hmm. haven't checked in and things have changed drastically and they're completely miserable, but they could have, checked in with themselves on a regular basis to make sure that they're on the right track and what other things, Mm -hmm. resources, uh, tools, skills that they could improve on that are out there that they can, um, that they can, you know, maximize on. And And I think that's a really good point. Smaller pivots over time instead of like, absolutely. I'm in a terrible place now. I got to totally switch it. You know, if you're like, if you're checking in, you can make a smaller pivot every year or something like that. I love it. So, yeah. yeah, I like that too, because Sometimes when people hear career change, I think they only think of big dramatic change. Yeah. And your your point is well taken, Becky, because we can make these small corrections along the way or by doing regular planning or, or reflection, mm-hmm. and that, that'll pay as many dividends as a big dramatic change, probably a lot more. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Good discussion. Uh, thank you all, and thank you, Jane, for joining us this week, and thank you, our listeners, for downloading today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. If you like what you hear, please sign up for our free weekly newsletter. In every issue, we give you the key points of that week's show. We also include links to all the resources mentioned, and you get a transcript of the full episode. Subscribe to the newsletter now, and we'll send you our new guide, the Top Career Podcasts of 2017. Discover all the podcasts that can help you find a great job and get the career you want. Get your free newsletter and podcast guide today. Go to maxlist.org slash topcareerpodcasts2017. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Will Thompson. He'll explain why you're not getting a second interview. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.